October 1st, 1966. I can't take it anymore. I reached under the mattress, pulling out my 38 revolver, and put it to my temple. Just pull the damn trigger. Stop being a coward. Life is not worth living anymore. I met my end. Nothing makes sense. Why try and fight this thing every day? For what? That was the first writing from 45-year-old Jason Tucker, dated October 1st, 1966. He was known to be a troubled recluse, but also a genius and a stout Christian. When his brother hadn't heard from him from over a month, he performed a wellness check on him. When his brother entered his house in Bakersfield, California on the evening of October 31st, 1966, he found dated writings on the walls listed in order. Jason had written every day for 31 days as his life drastically took a dark turn. What was discovered at the house, though, was beyond shocking and hideous. The following are some of his entries that were transcribed from photographs taken of the wall he wrote on them, leading up to October 31st. Also, an interview his younger brother Adam gave to an investigative journalist in 1967 of what happened upon him entering the house that evening. The reporter named it The Vanishing of Jason Tucker. October 2nd. I lost it all. Everything. Whatever this thing is, it's inside me and controls me. It can't be real. It just can't. If you're real, make it end, God. Please have mercy. Don't forsake your child. October 3rd. It waits to talk to me when it's dark. I get no sleep. I tell it to leave me alone, but it won't. It shows me cursed things, horrible things. What sort of malevolent thing is this? What kind of God would create such a thing? October 4th. I did what it said. I found the item. It's very old and written in a language I don't understand. There are dreadful drawings on it of things that can't possibly exist. How can this be happening? October 5th. It has shown me an alternative to this. Could it truly be better than this? Is there really nothing left for me here anymore? Days are long. I'm craving the darkness. I'm just so tired, so very tired. I don't care anymore. October 10th. I woke up this morning and the word of God, my Bible, was gone. Only ashes remain. Which path am I taking? Why will he not answer me? I am forgotten. One shows me love, the other does not. October 11th. I've destroyed all the mirrors in the house. Am I not me anymore? I think not. I reject the light more each day. Darkness is my only friend now, my comfort. October 15th. I crave now that which is not natural. The appetence in me goes against my nature and all that is human. Should I end it now before I slip further into the nothing? I feel it reaching for me getting closer with each passing day. October 17th. Am I being set free or being beguiled? Which one is the father of lies? I fear I do not know now. The appetence in me grows stronger with each passing night. There are still remnants of me, but it seems so distant, like another life long ago. October 18th. Last night it came to visit me. It said nothing just stared at me from the dark corner of my room until the light of the sun touched it. I know what I must do now. I cannot fight against this thing inside me. It has become me. October 23rd. Any good that has resided in me has all but died. I walked the dark, empty streets last night and searched for anything which would quench this ravenous desire. I brought it home and devoured it. I never knew I could feel like this. It's a euphoria like I've never experienced. October 24th. Twilight is now my sanctuary, my dark temptress, my inamorata. Never before have I felt such nirvana. Together we roam searching to satisfy that which must be appeased. October 27th. It's so close, so near. I will not be forsaken again. I long to be embraced by it. October 31st, it has begun. That was the last thing that was written on the wall by Jason. This is the interview Adam Tucker gave the investigative journalist in 1967.
Growing up, my brother always wanted to be by himself. He was highly intelligent, a genius in fact, but one thing he struggled with was religion. It was a love-hate relationship. Our parents were Christian extremists, so we knew the Bible cover to cover and were severely punished if we went against its teachings, even in the slightest. I came to terms with our upbringing and chose a different path, but Jason carried on with the extremism even after our parents died. He never said it, but I know this messed with his mind. When I got old enough, I left Bakersfield and moved to Sacramento while Jason stayed living in our parents' house. Without fail, though, he'd call me every Sunday and we'd talk for a while about the good old days when we were kids. I could tell he longed to go back and relive our youth. Aside from religion being shoved down our throats and the punishments, we had a fun childhood. The first Sunday Jason didn't call me, which was October 2nd. I didn't think much of it. In fact, I hoped he was out doing something with some friends or maybe even a woman. The second Sunday he didn't call, I knew something was up and thought about driving down to see him or even calling the police. But I know how much he would hate that and he's adamant about his privacy and not being bothered unless he says otherwise, so I did nothing. By the third Sunday, I had plans to drive down there to check on him, but my son broke his arm while he was out playing and I had to rush him to the hospital, which required surgery, so of course I didn't go. Keep in mind, I've been calling him daily to see if he'd answer, but he never did. It just so happened I needed to visit Bakersfield on the 31st and would be there all day, so I decided I'd check on him then. I woke up early that morning, around 3.30 a.m., to make the four-hour drive down there. I planned on going to the house after I finished my business, which would be late afternoon into the evening. As I drove through the dark that morning, the freeway was dark and empty. A lot of scenarios went through my mind as I made the long drive. I hadn't physically seen Jason in years, but always loved him, as he was my only sibling. As I pulled off the freeway into Bakersfield, a lot of memories came flooding back into my mind but also a dark eeriness. I felt uneasy the entire day as I went about my business. As the time got closer for me to pay him a visit, I started dreading going to the house I grew up in, but also what I might find when I got there. I hoped he was all right. Before heading to the house, I decided to stop and grab a quick bite at a local diner we'd eat at when I was a kid, as I was starving and didn't know what was going to happen over the next several hours. I'd say it was around 7 p.m. when I left the diner. The drive to my old house was about 10 minutes away. As I opened the car's door, I felt a pit in my stomach, and the thought crossed my mind to just drive home and call the police and let them handle it. After sitting in the car for a few minutes, I decided to drive to the house and get it over with. After all, he was my brother, and if something happened to him, it's better I find him than a stranger, I thought. When I pulled up to the house, it was completely dark as all the lights were off. It stuck out like a sore thumb being it was Halloween and all the houses on the street were lit up as kids filled the neighborhood. I took a deep breath as I opened the car's door and stepped out into the street. As I looked at the house, I thought how it hadn't changed much. Still had the same brown paint that was peeling. When I made it to the front door, I knocked on it several times saying, Jason, Jason, it's Adam, your brother. I waited for a few minutes, and when he didn't answer, I decided to go around back and try the back door. If it was locked, I knew how to get in through one of the basement windows. Just like I suspected, the back door was locked. I then walked over to the basement window, grabbed the two top corners, and jiggled it while sliding it open, and it worked, just like when we were kids. As I climbed down into the basement, the first thing I noticed was how bad it smelled. It was horrific. I had to pull out my handkerchief and cover my nose, otherwise I would have vomited. I walked over to the light switch and tried flipping it on, but the light wouldn't come on. I thought about calling out to Jason, but decided to make my way upstairs to see if I could find him, or at least a flashlight. The basement was pitch black, but I remembered my way around as I slowly fumbled my way along the wall. When I reached the door that led upstairs, I pulled my hand back as it immediately hit me that something wasn't right. It was like I could feel something was upstairs. I took a deep breath, mustered up some courage, and slowly opened the door. It wasn't as dark as the basement as I could see light shining through the living room window from the neighbor's house. I started walking up the stairs, carefully placing each foot as I did so as to be as quiet as possible. 
When I reached the top, and before turning the corner into the living room, I mumbled to myself to relax. As I walked into the living room, I was confused as I gasped at the horrendous smell. It took me a minute to figure out what was on the floor. When I finally processed it, I couldn't believe it. The floor was littered with the dead carcasses of animals. Some were just bones, some were half eaten. I also noticed one of the walls had writings all over it. I stepped over the carcasses as I walked over to the wall to see the writings up close. The first one, which was dated the 1st of October, took my breath away. But as I read more, I became confused, then scared. There were several more areas of the house I needed to check, but before leaving the living room, I tried turning on the light and again nothing. It seemed as if the power was out in the house. I walked slowly down the hallway to what used to be our parents' room, assuming Jason had taken that room when they died. As I got closer, I could see the door was shut and something had been drawn on it. It was a large star with a circle around it. Back then, I had no idea what it was. Otherwise, I might not have entered the room. Fear shot through me as I grabbed the handle, turning it as I opened the door. The room was dark, but light enough I could see as my eyes adjusted. I jumped and nearly fell down backwards as I saw a figure sitting in a chair in the corner of the room. Jason, is that you? I whispered loudly. It seemed like an eternity as I got no response, so I asked again, Jason, is that you? What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Leave. Now, he replied. I came to check on you, brother. Are you alright? I asked. You must leave now, he responded. He then stood up from the chair he was sitting on and started coming towards me as he shouted in a strange voice, Leave. Now. When he was about halfway to me, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It didn't look like Jason at all. It's hard to describe, but whatever it was, it was hideous looking. After seeing it, I quickly turned and ran down the hallway. Without thinking, I ran back down the stairs so I could escape through the window I'd come in. I didn't even pay attention if he was still coming after me as I made my way through the dark basement. Once I reached the window, I got through it as quickly as I could, ran back to my car, got in and sped away to the nearest payphone, and called the police. I waited about 30 minutes before going back to the house. When I arrived, there were several police cars out front. As I walked up to the house, I identified who I was. An officer then told me what they'd found and didn't find inside. I didn't say much as I still couldn't believe everything that had just happened. Officer Keenan and Officer Hackett were the first to arrive at the scene. They kicked in the back door and made a sweep of the house. They found the living room floor covered with the dead animals Adam had described. The walls in the room where Adam said he saw Jason were covered with pentagrams. Other than that, the room was empty, save for a single chair in the corner where he said he saw him sitting. In another corner of the room was a dark spot that looked like something had been burned there. In the basement, they found some very old papers that had things written on them no one could understand. Photographs were taken of the entire house and put away in a file along with the old papers. Jason was not in the house and was never found. The house was cleaned and sold the following year. Adam said he never plans on returning to Bakersfield. For more scary horror stories, please subscribe.